So I decided to take a little bit more of an approach of what is, what do we put into a GIS, and so this is more of the, the surface, uh, how do we get surficial data into a GIS. And so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about cartography, more of uh, kind of the map making, map making process. Uh, my name's Trent Hare, and I've been at uh, USGS for 26 years. Um, and I've been doing GIS for about 20 years. And it's been a challenge, but it's been fun. I think one of my favorite stories is uh, at JPL, um, working with some of the first GIS users. And there was a, a scientist who, who you know, showed me his two uh, laminate overlays and says, this is all I need for my GIS. I can do my overlays with, with my two paper copies. And so I thought that was a curious thing. And now that specific user is using a GIS. So. Um, and so I wanted to replace my logo with Glenda because she's awesome. So a lot of these slides are based on uh, talks by Randy Kirk and Brent Arkinall. Um, I didn't want to recreate the wheel here because they've done it before. So obviously there's no talk without the GIS layer figure and GIS, we say, nicely integrates the parts, but how? And, and in terms of cartography, again, we have this this thing, location. Um, we need geodesy, so size and shape of the body. Um, prime meridian, sea level, uh, lat latitude, longitude, if, I guess if you're doing astronomy, RA and DEC. Uh, you also need to know photometry, and I'll talk to each one of these shortly. Um, altimetry, topography, and then you get to cartography, and you finally get to GIS. So none of, GIS doesn't exist without these, without standing on top of these other sciences. And, and of course, if you consider GIS scientific visualization, but there's obviously many other ways to do visualization. So collecting data is not the same as mapping. Obviously we can collect data, but there needs to be a very specific goal to make that data GIS ready. And and it's interesting to see in the NASA decadal survey that there's a, a kind of a new twist that PIs are now supposed to make the data mapping ready or GIS ready. Um, it's not good enough just to submit the data to the PDS. And we'll see how well, we'll see how much that happens in the future, but a lot of times in Earth science you'll see that you never see the raw data. You only see the level two data or the map projected data. And that needs to happen more in the planetary community. Um, let the instrument teams calibrate the data. Let the instrument teams who are expert in that data figure out how to get it to the spatial reference. Um, but that includes a lot of things. Um, the assembly must be done with high precision. Different data products must be assembled to be consistent with each other. And that's one reason why some contend that, hey, if we all use the same system like ISIS or Vicar, we're trying to get the data into a into a, a single application so that they better fuse together in, 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 a, as you go on, as you assemble more and more data products. That's not necessarily the case. Any way you get to a map projection is, is good. If you can get them co-registered, even better. So GIS requires radiometric calibration. If you don't calibrate the data, it's not gonna basically be able to facilitate science very well. And that includes noise, bad pixels, um, wavelengths, temperatures, exposure times. So one of, the, one of the most difficult times we have with Mars is the thermal data. I mean, it's taken at all times of day and night. How are you gonna integrate those without knowing thermal models, without knowing atmospheric corrections? Very tricky. Um, GIS requires, obviously, the geometry, the spice, the spacecraft location. What, and then types of calculations. Not only do you have to just position the data on, this, on the globe, you also should bundle adjust the data together, and that helps uh, beat down the errors. And that's something that um, we try to stress at USGS as being very important. Not just one image at a time, but bundle adjusting a whole set of data. Orthorectification is something that's actually relatively new for planetary. We've only been doing it since the, as far as USGS goes, we've only been doing it since we've had MOLA. So since about the 2000, 2000 time frame. Before that, we basically orthorectified on a sphere. So now that we have topography, we can get better, 
better uh, registration. And so if you don't have geometric correction, this is an example of a, a early iPhone days. If you don't correct for topography, this is what you get. And on Mars, it's hard to tell that this is what you get, but this is what you would get without orthorectification. So just a good visual of, of what happens if, you're, if your craters look funny. Um, obviously, there's the, the original, the spice, the original camera pointing, and then we actually go through and adjust the camera pointing. So you can go back, see Smith the kernels, and you can update the camera pointing so that, you can, so that your images better align. So on Earth, a lot of times, you only, you only register the images together. You don't go backwards to the spacecraft and modify the spacecraft. And why is that important? It's important if you have multiple instruments. Uh, if you have multiple instruments, you can, if you register one, you can use that same backwards control to register another. Um, as you can see here, this is uh, actually uh, old, older data, lunar orbiter data. Um, without, with the original camera pointing, you can see the craters are, are messed up. So, oh, missed the slide. So without photogram, without photometry correction, this is what you get from the Viking era. If you just were to lay RGB down, this is the exact kind of uh, mosaic you get. So obviously, we need to understand the photometry where the sun's pointing, and this is basically what you get after you after you calibrate those images. So, kind of a dramatic shift. So you can see that there's clouds being removed. Um, some of the images don't have all the channels, so you have to emulate those channels. And you end up with something that's a little more respectable. So just to give a sense of how complicated this is, these are the, I don't expect you to read these, these are the, the workflows from Vicar and Isis. And we also uh, use socket set for topography. But you can see how complicated this can be for an individual scientist or a student to try to understand how do I get to a GIS? And you'll notice that you'll notice that level zero, level one, there's geometric control. There's level two, more geometric control. Level three, photometry, photoclinometry. Level four is mosaicing. That's that's when you can actually get to where most people are dealing with GISs. So not until you get to the light blue or dark blue boxes is where a GIS comes into play. And I think that's important to to just realize that that. We can't just take data. We actually have to process it. We have to control it. We have to calibrate it before we actually want to bring it into a GIS. And a lot of, I, I can see, you know, when we first started doing GIS, we didn't have that many map projected products. And so there was not a big need for GIS. There wasn't a big need to overlay data because we had one base map. And so, you know, when I started doing this back in, in the late 90s, there was one base map. There was MDIM 2, or could have been prior to that. And so you had maybe two databases. You might have had a crater database. You might have had um, one, one image. And so as, but once we hit the 2000s with all the new missions, MOLA, HRSC, now that became an issue. And so everybody wanted to try to fuse data, and that's where GIS kind of got a leg up. And that's, I think, why we're seeing this big increase. And also, people are learning how to use it. So, let's see. So the one thing that, for us, cartography and GIS really benefits geologic mapping. And so I wanted to give kind of a little history behind why we started supporting GIS. It wasn't necessarily to do analysis, it wasn't, it was to do maps. To publish maps, to print maps, to have maps done in proper Cartesian uh, map projections, to have them done with proper symbols, to have them done so that we could print them out. And so that was our excuse. My first GIS project on Planetary was uh, Taumasia Highlands, converting that from a paper map to a GIS. And that took, oh, I probably spent a year digitizing thousands of faults um, drove me nuts. But that's how, that's basically how I started my GIS career was the Talmasia map from uh, James Dome. And, 
And so the, the history of the mapping program, we were actually about up to um, 230 maps published. Started in 1962. Of course, we weren't using GIS back then. Um, we have plenty of Moon, Mars, Mercury, Venus. Uh, we go from all scales, and that's a big component of our GIS training is how to deal with scales. We've used airbrush maps, which are unthinkable now. Um, we've used hand mosaics and manual, uh, manual digitizing and where you're using an old plotter, um, and now we're, doing, now we're basically doing it all digital. So the, the USGS NASA program is funded by NASA. It supports us to publish about four to six maps a year. Now the one thing we're actually gonna try to do this year is not, so currently we only publish NASA funded maps. We're actually looking into an avenue where we can publish um, geologic maps done by you guys, our European colleagues, so that you can actually have a, an ESA funded map published by USGS if you, if you want. Um, what we have to do is, you know, NASA has trouble with that. Uh, you know, it wasn't done by a, a U.S. person, but it was using U.S. born data sometimes, usually kind of a mix of ESA and NASA data. So we actually are looking into trying to, to facilitate publishing European geologic maps, European funded geologic maps. And we might, we might only be able to do one a year, but, and, and it's kind of dependent on how many maps we have in the queue. But if you are working on a geologic map um, and you do want to have it officially published by USGS, then talk to us, let us know. Uh, I'll get you in touch with Jim Skinner, who's our map coordinator, took over for Ken Tanaka. Um, part, of our, part of our training is, or part of our, our goals are to provide the base maps, and that's a lot of times generated by you guys, provide the GIS tools, the training, um, and then we support the editorial and the nomenclature and then also published on a, on a website with an official publication. So the, the move to GIS for us um, really started in 1996 with the launch of Pathfinder and, and Mars Global Surveyor. We knew that we were gonna have multiple data sets to deal with. Um, we knew that we were gonna wanna integrate those as a, from a geologic standpoint. So again, as as mentioned earlier, the worst name in the world, Pigwad. The only reason why that's a good name is because people remember it. It's, it's now officially retired. Um, it, it, it won't go away, but it's retired. What I mean by it won't go away is people won't let it go away. Um, since the late 90s, and, and that basically was in support of raster layers. And half my job, unfortunately, was just conversion of data sets to GIS-ready data sets. I didn't want to do that, but I had to. Um, the other part of it was training and understanding how to deal with these map projections, how to deal with the different radii, how to deal with editing in a, in a GIS. And since 2008, we now supply all mappers with GIS-ready data. It, it's pre-formatted database. All they need to do is start adding lines, uh, start adding features. That doesn't mean that they, they have to as of 2008. Um, and so the standard template, you know, we actually are working with um, Stefan and, and Adrian Nas on standards, on geodatabase standards, on formats to try to make sure that they, they get organized. We could, we could work a little more on it. We haven't done it, anything lately. Um, but we do work with uh, the Federal Geographic Data Consortium, too, to work on symbologies. These maps are standardized in terms of metadata, in terms of symbology, in terms of publication. And so that's the one thing, by publishing a geologic map in a journal is fine, that's perfectly fine with us, but hopefully by going through the USGS we can make sure that everything is more consistent across science products. Um, and basically every mapper starts with an equivalent product so that they aren't, they don't feel like they're left out. In 2011 we actually changed the NASA geologic proposal uh, the call was changed. So now every single geologic map that's funded by NASA has to be done in a GIS. That doesn't mean it has to be done in ArcMap, um, but it has to be done in a GIS. It needs to be submitted to us in a GIS format. Um, in 2013, we will only publish 
GIS files. That still means we'll print posters, but we'll only publish, we, along with the poster, along with the map that you can hang on your wall, we'll publish the GIS files too. So you'll see the, la the, latest, the latest maps from Ganymede, Io, Mars, um, Tooting Crater, they're all, all the GIS files are out there and hopefully in a consistent form. So the database design, how much time do I have? I got five minutes. The database design is, is meant to be consistent and I don't wanna bore you with the details but we wanna make sure that we have similar layers, we have similar attributes um, they start with a map projection that they're, that they're comfortable with that minimizes distortion across the area. Um, the, the new PIGWAD is called the Mercator GIS Lab, and as much as we, that's an homage to uh, Mr. Mercator, it's not an homage to the Mercator projection, which is a horrible map projection once you go above 40. So, so we, we use Mercator projection, but and we don't want to support Mercator above 45 or something. So polar maps need to be polar, uh, semi-polar need to be Lambert or transverse Mercator. So we have, to, we have to make sure that we support the map so that it minimizes distortion for the mapper and, and for the, the science. That's less of an importance as far as GIS goes because you can switch projections at any time. So another thing we do is we try to make sure that the, for the geologic maps, and this is, this is good in general, if you have a, a domain that's outside of geologic mapping, it's good to think about what are your attributes gonna be. For craters, let's all call um, you know, a pedestal crater a pedestal crater. But for us, we have you know, geologic contacts, they need to be certain or concealed or inferred, and so we try to make sure that we standardize those nomenclature or those attributes. So we also use, and these are, the, these are the actual standardized symbologies that we're using. One of the reasons why we, we currently recommend ArcMap for mapping, for geologic mapping in particular, is because it has built-in support for these symbologies. Um, we need to work with other companies to support these standardized symbologies. They're all open, they're all out there, we just need to have them ingested into QGIS and other applications. So, you know, it, it's important to show gradational as a gradational so that you can go from map to map and you'll understand what that line means. It also is interesting, it, this is one thing that we have to beat across the heads of all of our mappers, is that a geologic map is special in terms of, it's not just a surficial map, it's an interpretation of events, it's an interpretation of timing, it's an age-based map. And so this event happened before this event, if you have, if you're, if you're doing, we've had, had this debate all the time, can you do automatic geologic mapping? And the problem you get into is you can get there halfway. It's a mixture, there is interpretation there, but a geologic map won't, or a, a mineral map won't tell you, does that unit come before this unit? It's important to know, does this lava flow embay this channel? Does this channel override this lava flow? And so that, might, you might be able to do that automatically, but that's, that's a pretty tough call. Also, the, the geologic contacts are, are extremely important. Triple junctions where three lines meet actually imply age. And so if you're, if you're not doing that correctly and you do a sharp edge, um, those are things that we look for during edits. We look for, does the triple contact imply age? If it, if it doesn't, if you don't see this, kind of pushing into the other one because this unit's younger or this unit's older, then we need to be able to represent that. So we always, we always beat our, our mappers into submission to say, no, you're not allowed to draw polygons, you have to draw lines first because that's, the, that's the, the separation of the, of the geologic units and then you define the contacts later. So just kind of mapping 101 for us. Um, and just to show some examples, um, this is just released, just pushed online um, I think I showed a map of the, the 20 million Mars geologic map that, that was released uh, last year. Um, it actually might have come out this year. Um, so scale's an important aspect. Geologic mapping, you don't wanna, your, your contacts or your edges, your boundary edges, you don't wanna see pixels. You don't wanna see a jagged line. You wanna see smooth contacts because again, those are 
important to, to showing that age difference between the, the units. Tudin Crater, uh, made by Peter McGinnis Mark, um, he was able to actually name this crater after his hometown, which wasn't known when he did that, and you're not supposed to do that. So he, he kind of snuck that one under, under us. But, uh, but anyway, so we give him a hard time. We're actually, for the Mappers meeting, we hold one every year. We're going to Hawaii this year, shucks. Um, but that'll be a fun time, but, but uh, he gets to kind of relish in his new map. And then, because of the new LROC data, because of the new high-rise data and HRSC data, we're actually able to get to geologic maps that look like Earth geologic maps. This is um, 18,000 scale. So, I mean, we're actually, this is not necessarily even a, a geologic map. It's more of a structural map. There's only, you know, probably half a dozen units. Those units are, are more important by the designation of the, of the structure. So we're doing strike dip calculations in GIS. Um, you know, we're doing fault density mapping. Um, there's, you can't, can't count craters on these things. There's not many craters to count. So at a high rise at 25 centimeter uh, scale, that changes how we do geologic maps for planetary. It makes it more Earth-like, and, and that's exciting. And, and so there's going to be so many more maps that are made at this scale, and, and that's, a, that's a neat aspect of, of uh, GIS in general, is that you can go from global and you can go down to, to local. So um, this is kind of my evolution. Um, and, and so basically kiss your cartographer is the, the end result. I, on, the, on the back end of these slides, I've added a bunch of other, a few other slides, I'm not going to go into them, but it basically talks about the map components. Um, so I just wanted to give you a backdrop of why I started GIS um, and why I think the community is still kind of growing up with uh, geologic maps. And kind of the benefit for me was that everything else started to come together with data fusion, crater catalogs, dune catalogs. Um, you know, I didn't have, the only reason I started to support it that because we could, but without, without that base of that excuse of geologic mapping, I wouldn't be doing GIS either. So that was kind of, so hopefully a fun history lesson, but that's it. Thank you. <laughs>